You know, we need to have, we have, we are in a fight for faith, for our own faith, especially in times like these. And thank you for tuning in for this and looking at this, and maybe share it with somebody if it helps you. What I want to talk to you about is as we fight for faith, there is a fight that is a faith fight about how to be happy. You know, this is um, uh, something that occupies all of us, really, even when we don't know it. I'd like you just to stop for just a moment. Just close your eyes for just a moment and ask yourself a couple things. Number one, what would it take for you to be happy? What would it take for you to be happy? Let me run it by you again. What would it take for you to be happy? Close your eyes. Keep them closed. And just try to remember the last time you were truly happy. The last time you were truly happy. Just remember the scene. What it looked like around you. What it smelled like around you. Who was there? Or if anyone was there. What you were looking at. When was the last time? What was it like? Remember it. The last time you were truly happy. And I don't mean that temporary thrill kind of happiness that we have like at the end of a game when the home run gets hit. I mean the happiness the Bible talks about. The Bible talks about the idea of the joy of contentment. The goodness of life. It's that time where you felt truly at peace. And remember that joy and peace go together. One more question. <laughs> if you just uh, be patient with me. How many people do you really know who are really happy? Now, we understand, uh, I talked about in the midweek service, and you might, the midweek message, you might look at it, in the message titled, Training for Unhappiness. There is the happiness of the thrill. It's conditional, and it's temporary. It comes and goes. It's like the sun, it fades, and then it comes back. And then there is the uh, happiness of the, but the, the problem with this is the happiness of the thrill, of the achievement, of the, the moment of triumph. Uh, it is temporary, and it is often followed by fear. The fear of it being ripped away from you, or you're ripped off because you got it, or it being stolen, ripped from your hands, or, or the jealousy that comes with that possessiveness, or the anger that that at anyone who you think or you're told or, or, or you're, you're, um, um, it's communicated to you that they threaten this thing or this person or this job, perhaps, that you have convinced yourself you need to be happy now. This is not always true, but in many cases, if you will take the time to drill down into your emotional stress, <laughs> what you worry about, you will find it is being driven deep down by your attempts at gaining or protecting what you are convinced you need to, in your life to be happy. Now, we get in the mode of thinking about people. We think that, you know, people, if I have these people in my life, if if these people like me or these people accept me or these people um, find me attractive, then I can be happy. Our places. We think of, you know, if I could just get out of this dumpy place, if I could just move to the city or if I could get out of the city and move to the country. <laughs> If I could get out of this cold climate and get to a warm climate, but you bring yourself. And that could be a problem. Now, it's not to say that there aren't places that could be easier for you or for me. But the, to assume 
And it's a belief that you get there and you're going to be happy because of it. Maybe we think it's possessions. If I could just get that truck or if I could just get this or get that house or get this new thing or, or buy this new thing that is this new gadget, then I'd be able to be happy. It could be some other kind of property or investment or it might be not just people, but popularity. Sometimes that idea of gaining some level of, of notoriety or fame is very attractive. We're pulled into it. The, the lust for applause is powerful. I think if I could just get that, then I could be really happy. Remember what I said about the sun? It comes and goes. <laughs> well... And oftentimes, we think if I could just be in control, power, if I had power, then I'd be happy. I am tired of having people tell me what to do. You know, Jesus taught in Luke chapter um, chapter 12, verse 15, he said, he was talking about two brothers who were convinced if they could somehow get ahead, if they could somehow get one up on each other, they were trying to divide their estate. <laughs> I hope you haven't been through that. And they were trying to get him to make a judgment about it. And he said, who made me an arbiter, arbiter between you two? And then he made the point that went to the core of almost every conflict that you see around those kind of issues. He said to them, beware and on your guard against every form of greed for not even when one has an abundance does life consist of his possessions you know if we really believed what jesus said you know a lot of the fussing and arguing and and um complaining i'm trying to get the sun out of my eyes it's fall and we have the sun isn't that great a lot of the arguments are this deep down assumption that if I have enough stuff or if I have enough control or power, then my, that's what my life is really all about. My life would be meaningful and happy. Jesus says, no, even in abundance, even when you have a lot. Life does not consist of possessions. You know, the problem that we're dealing with is that we are trying to run this kind of thinking in a time period where it's, even if it did work, it would be hard to have it work. It's a pandemic. And even if you think these things might work for you, they'd be especially difficult for them to achieve that in this, uh, this time period. Paul talked about, or Jeremiah talked about it. And I mentioned this in the midweek service. Jeremiah talked about the idea that, um, that in the middle of a crushing time period in the people of God in the Old Testament, he said, my soul has been rejected from peace. In other words, I've lost the ability to find peace. This is in Lamentation 3.17. My soul has been rejected from peace. I have forgotten happiness. I think a lot of people in our time, especially during this pandemic time, have forgotten how to be happy what happiness takes. And it's because these things I mentioned, you know, people and power and possessions and properties and popularity, and these things become idols that you pull along behind you as you travel the path toward happiness. You're trying to get someplace. You're dragging this trailer behind you. Now, it is true, and I think it is it's reasonable. People might argue about it, but people argue about everything that across the board, human beings have a deep desire to be happy. You know, uh, as followers of Jesus, we want salvation. Why? Well, you say, well, I want to be free from guilt. Why? Well, because I don't want to be insecure. Why? Why do we want to be free from fear or shame or why? Because we want to go to heaven. Well, why? To be happy. <laughs> I mean, Jesus recognized this clearly. He said in um, the book of Luke, he said, however, 
don't be happy that the evil spirits obeyed you. He was talking to his disciples and giving them a debrief after they had seen God do amazing things. He said, don't be happy that the evil spirits obey you. Be happy that your names are written in heaven. He was saying, happy about heaven. That's okay. You want to go to heaven and be happy. We we talk about that. We sing about uh, those the joys of heaven and reunions and happiness. Jesus understood our desire to get back to the garden. You know, that's why he, he we see in that old translation, some folks don't like it, but it still is an easy read. In Matthew chapter 5, 2, he says, he began to teach, the, this is out of the Good News translation, happy are those who know they are spiritually poor, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Now, the word is blessed, the Beatitudes are graced, but it can be translated happy in a very fair way. Happy are those who mourn, for God will comfort them. Happy are those who are humble, for they will receive God's promise, what he promised. Happy are those who, whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. God will satisfy them. And happy are those who are merciful to others, for God will be merciful to them. Happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And happy are those who work for peace, for God will call them his children. You know, Jesus says, happiness is okay. It's something that we aspire for. You know, a team of researchers kept failing as they kept trying to simulate a moon landing. They kept running it through their computer, running it through the computer. And every time they did it over and over again, it wouldn't work. Each time it resulted in a crash. Finally, Someone decided to, after all those attempts and failures, someone finally decided to go back and look at the programming, dig down into the code, and they realized that they had one decimal point that was out of place. You see, it didn't matter how many times they tried. It wouldn't work because the programming was faulty. You know, we spend our lives trying to land on the planet of happiness. (laughs) Yet our programming is faulty. We keep on making new attempts, thinking, well, I'll try this this time and that this time. And somehow, if we just run it again, it will land in a place of lasting happiness and satisfaction and contentment and peace. And we're trained to do this. You know, we're trained from the time we were young that we need to focus our life, focus your personality or change your looks or or look a certain way or or focus your goals. Why? So you can be happy. And if, if you buy this, then you'll be happy. That's what keeps Amazon in business. If you lose weight, then you'll be happy. That's what keeps diet sales and all these health products in business. If I could just be popular, and if you just be popular, if people just like you, that's what drives social media, isn't it? people how much attention they can get if you just had this job or this education or this this relationship this car then you'll be happy strive 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 and if you you do it your whole life you can but even when we get to those places where we have those successes and those relationships and those moments it doesn't work for long And it is true that in our day, especially in where we live in this country, we have more stuff. You have more stuff. I have more stuff. You have more connectivity, more degrees, better educated, but higher levels of depression, higher levels of anxiety, hostility, especially when someone threatens your pursuit of happiness. And as I mentioned on Wednesday, that phrase was there was a discussion about whether it should be the pursuit of happiness or the pursuit of property, because those two are often confused. It is tragic that the sales uh, corporations will exploit this and politicians will as well. And yet for try and push you or you use these pressures that we have, our fear of losing out to get us to move one way or the other. And yet we keep on falling for it. We keep on trying one more attempt and one more failure. This is exactly what Paul teaches us. He says, 
and this is why when you really read the Bible and you get all your the stuff that you've kind of mixed in and bundled into it out of the way, you see how radical Paul really was. What Jesus was calling us to was so really countercultural in his idea, especially of, of what we often see in our dominant culture. In First Timothy chapter one, he says in verse or chapter six, verse six, now there is great gain in godliness when it's accompanied by contentment. That contentment. For we brought nothing into this world and we cannot take anything out of this world. In other words, he's saying, he's stating the obvious. This stuff that we keep striving for, it's not going to last. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. This is what we learn. We learn how to be content in that way. And then he gives a warning. But those who desire that you're driven to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare. He doesn't say he, he doesn't say could. He says those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now listen carefully. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. That doesn't sound like happiness. Now we're craving it. We're driven toward it. We wander away. But you're pierced through with many a pangs. That doesn't sound good. He warns us further. He says, but as for you, O man of God, he's saying, for those of you that really want to walk with God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness. That's what you need to be after. Godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And then he says what we've been talking about all along. Fight the good fight of the faith. So how do we do it? What are some things that you can do starting right now? Well, First of all, you've got to change your mind. You have to take a little bit of time to look through your programming. <laughs> Those simulations keep crashing, so you're going to have to look through your programming. That's what Paul says. Some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Then in reference to your former manner of life, the Bible tells us. You see, he's saying you're going to bring yourself hurt, but Ephesians 4.22 says that in in this, instead of living like that, in your reference to your former manner of life, lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit. You remember Paul said the craving that goes along with this? And then he says, do this, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You got to change the way you think. You got to change the way you think. You got to look at your programming. And realize, you know, I've been thinking that if I just got to this point or I just got to retirement or graduated from college or my kids raised or if I just got married or if I just got unmarried <laughs> or if I just got this thing or that thing, then I would get there. No, that's a way to have pain, pain your whole life, not happiness. It's not wrong. Those things are fine, but they won't bring you happiness. Secondly, you need to turn from from idols. You've got to turn from idols. You say, you know, the Christian life really is you turn from dumb idols to the living God. I mean, that's a huge part of the uh, definition of the Christian life. Well, remember, identification precedes eradication. Identification precedes eradication. In other words, you got to list them. The, take, a, take a pen and a paper, maybe before you get done with this, when you get done watching this, Sit down and, 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 and before the Lord, ask the Spirit to help you. And make a list of things that could turn into uh, things that you depend on, that you rely on, that you've convinced yourself you have to have for happiness. These turn into like idols. Those things, those people, those achievements that you've attached to your ability to be happy. You tell yourself, I cannot ever be happy again without, and then you fill in the blanks. 
Now, if you've lived a while, you realize that you told yourself that, but then time passed and you learned to laugh again. <laughs> you learned to go on. You see, idols are not real. These things that we attach ourselves to, they're not real. These are not facts. They're just beliefs. False beliefs, really. You see, they're the, they're the, it's the reality that you have been convinced or you've convinced yourself that you can't be happy without you fill in the blank. So make a list of all the people and the places and the things that you have raised up as essential things for you to be happy or essential things that you have to have to stay happy. And this is really important for you to do that. So, you know, it's important for you to remember that sometimes you find yourself being fearful. Maybe that you're, you're angry and you get, like I said, you may get jealous. You, you start to think about these things. What if I don't have them? What if this person's not there because you don't have it or could lose it? And you might even uh, convince yourself that, well, if I really love them, uh, if I really love somebody, I would have to, you know, I, I, I couldn't live without them. Well, that really isn't love, is it? Is it love to say um, to somebody, well, I can't live without you. You're responsible for me to be happy now. <laughs> the third thing is drop that trailer you're dragging behind you. Now you have one. We all have one. And by the way, there's always one parked close by for us to hook up. Remember the story, the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, of course, said, have you kept the commandments? And he said, I have from my youth up. And then Mark chapter 10, verse 21, it says, and looking at him, Jesus felt love for him. And he said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you possess and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. I love that passage because it says Jesus felt love for him. And I've often wondered, why does that put that in there? And, and I've thought different things over the time, but I was just spending some time with the Lord about this. And I think, I think that the reason it says that is because Jesus did love him. And I can't know for sure why he loves him, why he loves any of us. But you know what I think? He loved him, and it was obvious to everybody because he could see that this young man, this young, religious, sincere, honest, super rich guy, popular guy, he was really trying. He was like you. He was trying. You probably wouldn't be, if you were, if you're listening to this, you're probably trying. But even though he was trying all this stuff, trying to be a good guy, trying to be religious, trying to help in the, the local congregation, doing all that stuff, keeping all of the standards, he was still striving because everything he was doing didn't satisfy him. So Jesus says to him, essentially, let it go. Cut it loose. Chip over those idols that are holding you back. Detach. Drop that trailer that you're pulling. The one thing you lack, he said, go and sell all that you possess and give it to the poor. Then you'll have, they, then come follow me, he said. Give it to the poor. In other words, it wasn't like he was just going to like set it over here and put it in storage. It was going to be gone. He was cut. He was cutting the trailer loose. And come follow me. Jesus was saying to him, you know. What you really need to satisfy your soul, I'm all you need to really rely on. But you know what his response was? And I think his response is probably pretty common. Probably like most of us. Mark 10, 22, he said, but at these words, he was saddened. Or as some translations say, he went away sad. And he went away grieving. You know why? For he was one who owned much property. He was wealthy. He had a lot. He was grieving. He just couldn't do it. He couldn't let it go. That was his security. That was his, his ticket to happiness. 
that was he, he couldn't do it or he wouldn't do it maybe it was just too much work you know he'd have to go through all that stuff and let go of it that takes a lot of thought and effort he had much you know what I think Jesus feels sorry for you too and for me he has compassion you're stuck with that programming that you will ne- that that will never give you what you're really looking for, which is contentment and happiness. And Jesus' disciples didn't know what to do when when this was this happened. In verse 23, it says in Mark 10, and Jesus looking around, he said to his disciples, "How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God to really live under the rule of God." The disciples were amazed at these words, and Jesus answered again and said to them children how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God they were amazed and then he said it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and they were even more astonished and said to him who then can be saved just like you as a modern wealthy person you don't think of yourself as but you are by most world standards and certainly in historic standards Just like you as a modern person who has a lot of stuff, you're astonished. You're appalled at this. We try to soften this and, you know, talk about a, a, you know, a gate in the walls of Jerusalem. You know, I think this is really means it means exactly what it says it means. It's easier for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know why I think that's what it means? It isn't all about it just being hard. It's impossible. It's impossible also to know what he has for you as long as you're hanging on to your idols, to those things that you're relying on. Remember, verse 27, looking at them, Jesus said this. He said it was impossible. With people, it is impossible. But not with God, for all things are possible with God. You see that eye of the needle thing? You can't get a camel through the eye of a needle. It's it's a, a something people can't possibly do. If you're wealthy and you, the more you have, the more it's a challenge for you. The harder it's going to be. It's more easy to tempt yourself into believing that somehow, if you just get a little bit more, you're gonna then you're gonna be secure and happy and content. It's impossible to get there when you think like that. But with God. All things are possible. It's possible for you if you change your mind and you turn from your idols and you disconnect that that trailer, drop that trailer, and you follow Christ. You know, when we talk about fighting for faith, this is the real fight of faith. This is where we live. And this is the only fight that you really need to be in. And so I want to encourage you to make that list, take that time, pray about it, and realize that everything you need to be really happy, God's already given you right now. He has. You say, well, that's making me mad. That's making me really unhappy to hear you say that. No, it's not the put down. It's just the most freeing, positive thing ever. And it's at that point that you can really begin to really love people completely. And life completely. You know, um, if this has been helpful to you, I'd like to ask you to share it with somebody. Just send it to them. Ask them what they think. And then I'd like you to uh, respond in some way. Um, you might say, uh, in these next steps, you'll, they'll be on, your, um, on the same page. I commit to identify. That means you make the list. And drop all that I rely on but Christ. For happiness that's a good place to start to change the way you think i'm willing to give all and follow christ by faith that means you may need to give some things away get rid of some stuff you may need to see what he wants you to do listen to him say that and then you might say pray i will seek happiness in christ alone that's the only place to start start by turning from yourself and from all these other things to him alone and trust him i mean look He gave everything for you on the cross and overcame death for you and offer you every tomorrow forever. 
It's a great thing. You see, uh, and then maybe you would say, you know, you've really challenged me to give. I'm not very faithful in my giving, but I want to be giving. I want to be giving. I want to start right now giving. Giving away is give as much as I can. Like like one preacher said, do your giving while you're living so you're knowing where it's going. <laughs> so you can go down to that give um, that give button and you can push that button and it'll explain it. And there's one option. You could become a recurring giver. Then you it's just set up and you just do it on a regular basis. You know, um, we have much. And the best preventative medication for... Um, idolatry and greed and selfishness and generosity. I thank you and thank you for listening and I pray for you. I will. Let me know how I can pray for you.